Welcome to Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly with host Nancy Becker on Global Voice Radio. Nancy and her guests will share tips and recommendations on moving forward in your life and business now and not waiting till pigs fly. Here's your host, Nancy Becker. Hi everyone, good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly, where we have conversations on tips and strategies to grow your business from point A to point B. Today we're going to be talking with Nathan Siegel, who has been working in the digital world for 20 years, originally as a camera operator for multi-image shows and later in the field of computer graphics. In 1996, he worked with a team of photographers creating images for stock photography catalogs. By 1998, he became a freelance writer specializing in photography and computer graphics. In 2006, wanting to earn more, he entered into a joint venture with the Corel Corporation and wrote a manual which was branded to their software. It sold over 11,000 copies and helped generate $4,400,000 in sales. These days, he's involved with more course creation. His main topics are about mindset. And I remember Corel. That was what I first, you know, well, it wasn't Word. I never used Word. I used, what was the Corel? Word Word Perfect. Word Perfect. I used that for years and the Corel drawings. And then when that sort of faded away and everybody did Word, it was like, oh my goodness. So I probably used your manual (laughs) at one point. You you might have. Uh, The manual is, um, there were two versions of it, the, the Corel Photo Paint. Uh, 13 and 14 insider mm-hmm. and so you, if you were using photo paint during those years you might have used my manual because it came as a value add with their software how interesting that's great uh, well welcome Nathan and I'm glad you're going to you. be here with us today so thank let's you. just jump right into this and start talking um tell me how you got really got involved in all of this back in the beginning <laughs> Well, the photography side of it was just a, an interest, and um, I really liked special effects, and I met a guy in Vancouver, which, uh, area where, which is where I was living at the time. His name is Ken Cooper, and I learned about special effects photography. Then I learned about something called the multi-image industry, which was using uh, computer-controlled pin-registered cameras. This is dinosaur stuff now. <laughs> But we would do special effects through a combination of camera techniques, uh, Codalith, which is, was a high contrast black and white film, special lighting tricks, uh, step and repeat techniques, as they were called, and using animation stand equipment. And so I wound up getting this one camera, and I worked in the multi-image industry, as it was known, in 1988 and 1989. And when that phased out, then I wound up in computer graphics, later in stock photography, and then moved into freelance writing. So, But every part of it was using photography and computer graphics. Let's talk a little bit about computer graphics, because I've been using computers since, you know, the, since you know, Word Perfect and, and computers that didn't even have hard drives. They had 10-and-a-half-inch floppies, and, and yep. was the main operating system and I don't know if you remember K pros or not, but I had Yes four, I do. I have four K pros. I've still got two out in my garage. <laughs> Those things need to go to the Smithsonian. It was um, good for warming your hands maybe. Yeah, yeah. But I mean I, I you know talking about the dinosaur stuff, I'm right there with you because I've been there. But yeah. graphics have not ever been something that I felt comfortable with. You know, and, and it's, I'd much rather have someone else do the graphics, but what we started talking about a couple of minutes ago before we were on the air was screenshots. And I belong to a a program called um, 
Oh, I think it's called AppSumo. Have you ever heard of them? Yes. Yes, I have. I, I belong to that whole, and I get their emails all the time, and I buy software from them a lot. And interestingly enough, what popped up this morning was a program that was about screen sharing. And everybody's right. always sending me these little pictures and say, oh, well, look at this, and this is what your screen. And I go, how the heck do you do that? Tell us about screen sharing. What's, what's well, involved? Uh, ironically, within, within Zoom, I'm just going to uh, uh, look at this. If you, Zoom offers the opportunity to do screen sharing. So if you were to go to the bottom toolbar, and you go to the center, you will see a little green box with an arrow pointing straight up, and it, shares, it says uh, share the screen. So if I click on it, um, you're not able to see what I'm seeing, but it will give you a whole bunch of options like desktop, which is where we are. If I were to click on it, you would, well, do you want me to do it just to? It's not going to show. We're just audio on this. so. Oh, like, okay. Well, then us. it's fine. But you can then tell us all about it. Yeah, sure. It's just uh, it brings up your your desktop and a number of different windows. Like uh, looking at mine here, I've got my desktop. I've got, got uh, sticky notes. I've got a web page, my high voltage uh, something, uh, my Skype uh, login information, and and different programs on my on my desktop. If I click on any of those windows, like it highlights it in green. And then I click on share screen and that will be shared with the, the viewers. So that's a, that's a really easy way of doing it. Another way is within uh, like a, a number of different ways that I do sharing a screen is, is within Skype. And I'm just having a look at it right now because there are a number of different video, uh, sorry, windows. And I'm just trying to see where it is. Uh, yeah. So if you're in Skype and you go under the call tab, and on your, you're on the live call, you can click on the share screens and that will allow you to literally share your, your screen with whoever your audience is. And if you want to go one step further, you want to record all of this, then I recommend getting a program like Camtasia Studio, which will allow you to not only record the screen, but also the audio of your microphone and the and the voice input of the, the person that you're talking with. It can be extremely useful, especially if you want to explain a process and you want to show people what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So share, like screen sharing is one way of doing it. Yeah. Okay. Now, I know another thing is I'll get, I'll get emails, for instance, and within an email, there'll be a picture of yep. something that someone has grabbed a, a screen grab, I guess it's called, you know, how sure. do you, do, how do you do something like that? And why should someone be aware of those kinds of things and know how to do that? The bottom line is it comes down to explaining a process. One of the major mistakes made by people who are trying to convey instructions is that they give the instructions in text only. If you do that and the person you're talking with has no idea what you're talking about and you don't have any visuals to explain it, they won't be able to follow your process. Uh, as an example, uh, I remember reading a tutorial years ago where it was talking about a graphical process and it said, go to the library. I couldn't find it. I spent 20 minutes trying to find step one and I couldn't get there. And I gave up because I had no other choice. If they had provided visuals, little screenshots of, uh, even of icons on the desktop showing me where to go to find the information that I needed, I would have been able to continue. But without that, I was totally lost. And I wound up doing a review for this one company. And I said, your number one problem and why you're probably getting a truckload of support calls is that you've got almost nothing in terms of visuals and your site is full of all this graphic stuff and people are not going to be able to follow the process and you will be flooded with support calls because you made, this is one major mistake that you made. You fix that, your sports support calls are going to dramatically drop. And the guy said, yeah, you're right. We've got to do that. Thank you. Yeah. So like images are so important. Like, like one of my editors said to me one day, he said, uh, you know, I'm looking at your articles and I feel like I'm watching a slideshow. And some people may have taken that, oh, that's an insult. But the, the truth is, software has become so complicated, 
and so diverse with so many buttons and hidden menus and this and that. If you don't use graphics to explain it and use graphics for everything, even if you think it's relatively insignificant, there's an excellent chance you'll lose the user and they won't be able to follow the process. It's just the way it is. Yeah. So how the heck does someone do something like that? It's actually pretty easy. I mean, initially the way you would do a screenshot is there were, I forget the exact keystrokes, but you could do and you could capture your entire desktop but that's not practical if you want to create a tutorial or a step-by-step or a checklist or something like that. You need software that allows you to capture a portion of the screen, the part that you want to capture, and do it relatively quickly. And the software I use is by a company called TechSmith. The software program is called Snagit. It's been around for a lot of years. I've been using it for the bulk of my career. And Snagit will allow you to... to Uh, select regions on your screen and it will allow you to size it by percentage or by pixels and can be really useful for setting up uh, a um, an instructional process and I find it's really fast and easy to use you can save it in a variety of formats you can you can even use it to create little movie snippets and so on but I, I only use it for screenshots because that's my primary task is it complicated to figure nope. out how to do this? No. Well, it's complicated only because they keep changing the version. Okay, I have a version from years ago, and I refuse to upgrade because actually the newer version, I, I don't like it. It's got too many bells and whistles, and I prefer the earlier version because it's more basic in terms of Windows function. It just makes it easier to use. Is it a free software? Do you have to pay for it? You have to pay for it. Sorry, not free. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's the way it is with most things. I know that there's a program that I use that just comes along with Windows, and it's called Snippet, I think. And um, Could be. I don't know if it. But. Yeah, that one's, I'm pulling it up right now. Yeah, it's called a snipping tool, and it's right apart. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Windows. I'm using the latest version of Windows, and it it's pretty good, but I, it's very very basic. And, yeah. Well. So, yeah. Snagit Snagit is a lot more than that because you can you can uh, highlight windows. Uh, like let's say you take a screenshot, but you want to illustrate certain things in it. You can literally highlight it, add uh, drawings to it, like go here with a red marker, or yellow. Or, all sorts of different highlighting tools. That's you, 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 can, uh, you can remove areas that you don't want people to see, blur it out, and so on. Very useful. I it's like it a like lot. Paint, right? Paint can... In a way, I suppose, but paint wouldn't allow you to do screenshots, I don't think. No, but you can do the writing on it and all of that, oh. which, I, which I think is really an, a neat addition. So why would a small business you know, a mom and pop, a one person organization, why would they want to be able to take pictures of things on their computers? It really depends on the application. If they're doing like I'm doing and they're writing instructional processes, they need to be able to show their customers how to do it. Like I said, text is not enough. If if you're dealing with a graphical package, and mind you, any software package, you need to be able to show people where to go, what to do, uh, what the steps are. You can write out the steps, but if there are no visuals, you're going to lose your audience really, really fast. You have to show them, even icons. And if you make the assumption that uh, the users will be able to fill in the gap because of stuff you know, that there's an excellent chance it's going to fail. The, the mindset that one needs to have, in my opinion, if you're going to explained in an instructional process is assume that the user knows absolutely nothing and that you have to explain every single step to them. And if you do that and then afterwards you test it, either yourself to make sure you've got it right or with somebody else to check it over, then you're going to find the flaws in what you're doing really quickly. And then you can fix it. And it's extremely important that you cover all the steps. Yeah. Does it make sense that someone could do something like that even for themselves? What if they're making a a handout for for themselves, saying, for instance, um, a smart goal, and they can't really remember how to do a smart goal, and they make themselves notes and say, "Fill in yeah. this." Yeah, 
it's hugely it's hugely important that uh, you create checklists of important processes in your business even if you don't use it for six months because the problem is if you don't do it you're going to have to relearn everything all over again it's going to cost you an enormous amount of time and uh, yet if you take the time when you're learning it to create a checklist and you do all of that f- for yourself next time you encounter it oh I've got the checklist and you just go through it and you can get it done in a fraction of the time. Yeah. And I think whenever we're learning new software, which we do quite often these days, because there's always something new coming up and there's always something new that we want, having the ability to work with yourself on learning that software and creating these checklists is probably a good thing too. Don't you think? Yeah, it would be. And the other option is finding tutorials that exist that show you how to do it if they uh, if they are available and uh, like either bookmarking them or downloading them and printing them. Those are really important to have. Anything that will help you save time because if you have to relearn it, it's going to cost you a lot in terms of time and energy and opportunity. So Now you just said something that I know is a little bit off the the path of what we're talking about, but I'd like to explore that for a second because I don't think a lot of people understand these things either. You talked about bookmarking something. Sure. How Um, and why does someone want to bookmark something? um, It's something I do all the time. It's, It's simply because I find something useful. I want to be able to reference it later. So I would create a, a folder, say, within Chrome or some other browser that I'm using, and then go to the, the bookmarks menu and create a, I usually create, I'm trying to remember, it's either a folder or a bookmark. And then when I find sites that match my concept, I save them to that location in bookmarks so I can come back to it later. Because some, if you don't do it, you find something interesting and you accidentally close the browser or the browser tab, on that topic, you can't remember what it is. It can take an enormous amount of time to try and find it again. And yeah. even with my practice of bookmarking, sometimes I forget and I close the window and then I have to go into the history and pray that I can actually find it. And sometimes I can't. And then I wind up on this long search trying to find what I had before. Yeah, it, it can be a, a real pain. Yeah. yeah. Bookmarks are incredibly helpful, but Oftentimes, I think people don't really know about them or or understand them. And it's something really simple. You just create a topic, you know, I I think it's, uh, they're called bookmarks in Chrome. Yeah. You know, I I set up one for retreats, one for podcasts, one for graphics. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I have tons of them, tons of them. And you you can export them too. And sync them on on various devices as well, so it can be very handy. That's really handy because, say, I've got my computer here in my office, and I'm out doing something, and I've got my tablet. And yep. what's the what's the name of that website? What am I looking for? Oh yeah, I know. Well, you know, it's 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 in my bookmarks, and I just have to. Well, there, you know. yeah, there's there's actually another thing that I've been doing, which is not bookmarking in the usual sense. But if I find that um, that I come across something really interesting and I'm on my smartphone, I do a lot of research on that. Uh, I have a little program. I, let me just check here so I can reference it properly. So for those who are listening to this, I, I use an Android. Mine is an Alcatel uh, One Touch Idol 3. Not that that's terribly important, but it could be to someone who's listening to this. But the... The program I use is called Inkpad Notepad. It's just, uh, let me just, uh, well, not going to help to hold it up to the screen because <laughs> it's audio. But I mean, just so you just so you can see, I'm not sure how well it shows up, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you can see the program. And so what I do is I, I open a page and I just name it whatever. And if I find a whole bunch of really cool articles, that I want to copy and that I want to use all in one place later, 
I copy over the URLs. I could just click on the URL, select the whole thing, copy it, paste it into one of these documents. And then I use Inkpad Notepad to sync to uh, my desktop, open the document, copy it out, copy it into a Notepad thing. And then I've got it on my desktop with all these links in one location, let's say public speaking, and I can just access them when, whenever I need them and work on that particular topic and that can be useful too yeah, you could transfer it you could transfer it into a bookmark as well very ink pad notepad correct yes yes everybody take a take a note of that and go check it out if you use android and is it only uh it works just from your tablet or your phone but that it That's, goes back over to your desktop too uh as far as i know i, I don't have a tablet uh but, but I mean, it's for, it, it's for Androids. It's not for Windows. It's for the Android operating system. That's for the Android, as far as I know. Okay, yeah. So uh, that uh, don't quote me on that. The only way to find out is going to the App Store. Question it whether you can use it on the iPhone. I don't know if it's made for the iPhone. I'm having a clue. All right. Well, everybody, go check it out. It sounds like a very useful piece of software here. So now you've got two. This has been a this has been a great talk. We've got Snagit and Notepad. So that's great. What else do you use on a regular basis that's computer based that you think would be beneficial for sorry, some somebody is yelling at me from outside. Can I can I address sure. that? I'm sorry, sure. hold on. That's fine. All right. So um, we were talking a second ago about any other types of software or techniques that, you know, sounds to me like you're like me and I spend 29 hours out of my 24 a day working on computers <laughs> and need yeah. to be able to, at times, make things easier. Yeah. So well, what suggestions do you have for doing that? Well, one of the major other tools I use is Camtasia Studio. In Camtasia Studio, I use it for recording the screen. Like, um, and there are other little things like one of the, a little side project I've been doing is I've been working with a, a site called iTalkie, which is an opportunity for me to work with uh, uh, different, well, okay, to teach English to non-native speakers. And so one of the things that I do is I have a little program, uh, I think it's called Skype Call Recorder. It's free, plugs into Skype, and allows me to record audio calls. So when I get on a call with a student, I'm able to record the call, save it as an MP3 file, send it to the student for their, their study after the fact. You, you can do the same thing with Camtasia Studio. It has a screen recording function. And... When you record all of that, you get both sides. You just simply strip out the screen and using the output options, I'll put an MP3 file. But, uh, but the other way to do with explaining processes, yes, you could write a paper on it or you can make a video. And if you make a video, then you, you can edit it. You can clip out sections you don't want and then save the entire thing as a, usually as an MP4 file. And I've been doing that for years. Um, MP3 versus MP4. A lot of people say, well, is this an MP3? And I'm going, well, no, it's an MP4. Well, what's the difference? It's just a newer version, right? No, it's not. MP3 no. is for audio. MP3, MP4 is for video. Video. Oh. Okay. Yes. Yes. Like MP3 is audio only. There's no video that goes with it. MP4 contains the audio and the video of what you're doing. Ah. Okay, see, I learned something new today, too. That's great. Yay. Okay. <laughs> what else can you think of that, you know, before we close out our session, what else do you think of that, you know, as a small business owner yourself, you know, there are things I'm sure that you do regularly that make life easier for you. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us before we end our call today? Well, there's one thing, like, since I'm a traveler, uh, where I live here in Mexico, m many people, many of my friends use WhatsApp, which mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard of. Oh, yeah. And one of the things about WhatsApp that, that, that I absolutely love is the, the program has some kind of really interesting things about it. But if I go into WhatsApp on my phone, uh, just so I can find it, just so I can talk about it in an intelligent way, 
is let's say I click on somebody's name to do with the chat. If you go to the bottom of the list where like type a message, if you click on the paper clip, it brings up a number of things like document, camera, gallery, contact, location, and audio. The one that's really cool is location. Because if you're wanting to help somebody find where you are, you click on the location button and it will allow you to share a live location, send your current location um, accurate up to 26 meters. Or if you've got a whole bunch of things listed, different places where you've been, you could click on the location of that place and it will share a map with a pinned uh, thing to, um, to whoever it is that you want to share that with. And when I found that out, it's like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is really, really, really useful. And if you're a traveler, highly recommend it. I mean, WhatsApp is free. It gives you a lot of options. Yeah, it does. And very popular, so. That's great. Well, boy, we've sure had a lot of wonderful information in a very short amount of time today. And I thank you so much for being with us. How can somebody get in touch with you if they want to talk with you more or have you do some graphics for them, you know, hire you sure. to, to do some work? How, how do they get in touch with you? A couple of places would be through Facebook. If you just type in Nathan Siegel as uh the name within Facebook, you'll find me that way. Another way is through my personal website, which is nathansiegel.org. And you can get in contact with me there. And another way, very simple way, is by phone, 408-844-4851. And that's a U.S. number, by the way. Even though I live in New Mexico, it's a U.S. number. So it'll save you a lot of long-distance calling fees. Right. Yeah, that does. Well, wonderful. Thank you again so much, Nathan. It's been just a wonderful conversation we've had. Um, for everybody listening, please go to Spreaker and uh, subscribe to Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly. You can also hear us on iHeartRadio, on SoundCloud, and on iTunes. We're um, Go ahead and subscribe so that you don't miss any of our upcoming uh, talks that we're going to be having. You can hear them on Thursday evening at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And of course, you know, you can always get a hold of me at nancy at don't wait till pigs fly.com. Until we talk again next time, take care, be productive, and soar higher. Everybody have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly with host Nancy Becker. Join Nancy every Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern on Global Voice Radio.